Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming out on such a pretty day. It's good to have you inside here. Um, I want to introduce lifetime Longhorn Jay Gibson. He's a UT graduate who has a remarkable set of accomplishments, both in the, the field of business and in public service. Um, I'm going to just skim the highlights. Uh, when, he, when he started off at his first company, he rose through the ranks very rapidly. In, in short order, he became CFO, COO, executive vice president, and then seemingly as if just to prove that wasn't a fluke, he went to his second company and, and did the exact same thing, uh, rose quickly through those same uh, trio of jobs. But at that point, public service called. Uh, President George W. Bush in 2006 appointed Jay to be the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Management Reform. Just think about what a daunting task that is to go to an enterprise as large and complicated and expensive uh, and perhaps inefficient as the Pentagon and be in charge of streamlining operations and finance. Uh, he did well. He then became the CFO of the Air Force, where his budget he was managing was $124 billion with a B dollars. Um, but then he returned to the private sector and uh, was working in M&A before becoming CEO of a private sector space flight and rocket engine company that operated out of the spaceports. I love saying that. Spaceports in the Mojave Desert and Midland, which I was unaware was a thing, the old Mojave-Midland connection. Um, Public service called him once again more recently. He returned to the Pentagon to be the number three official in the entire Defense Department. That is, immediately after the Secretary of Defense and the Deputy Secretary, he was the Chief Management Officer. He's now back in the private sector and back on campus with us, and we're excited to have a dialogue with him today. So if I could ask uh, Jay and Will to come join us, we'll, we'll uh, grab the seats over here and get started. All right, well, thank you very much to Dean Hartzell for the generous welcome and uh, for hosting us here in these uh, really uh, palatial digs, I gotta say. So uh, Rolling Hall is a, a wonderful, wonderful resource for McCombs and for the university. Uh, as uh, uh, Bobby mentioned, uh, I'm the executive director of the Clement Center for National Security and along with the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, which Bobby, uh, Bobby directs, you can see our banners up there, we are honored to be co-hosting here today with, uh, with, with the McCombs School. Uh, for a brief introduction for any of you who have not come across the Strauss and Clements Centers, uh, you can consider us, we're both uh, university-wide centers reporting directly to the tower, and we are um, one of the primary nodes for UT's overall engagement on national security policy and strategy. And that, of course, by design, uh, is an interdisciplinary field of inquiry, right? There's no one particular department or school or academic discipline or unit that has a monopoly on figuring out what we need to do for our country national security and addressing a lot of international challenges. So Strauss and Clements both, both work closely with um, most of the academic units uh, on campus. Uh, most frequently, we're uh, interacting with the LBJ School and the Law School and the Government and History Department, some area studies. But I gotta say, it is a lot of fun partnering with McCombs, and uh, we hope that this will be uh, the early stage of an ongoing series of collaborations. So Dean Hartz will walk out. We're gonna be, watch out. We're gonna be coming back to you. Um, so. Anyway, uh, we're gonna do a structured dialogue here today. Uh, Bobby and I will be uh, alternating some questions to, to Jay Gibson and looking forward to his insights on those. And then we will also be eager to take some questions from the audience. So, um, Bobby, over, over to you for sure. the first one. So, I'd like to start by uh, building from the observation that you've managed very large enterprises before, but um, I'm not sure there is a larger enterprise overall than the Department of Defense in the United States. So, from that executive perspective, um, what was, can we start with the governance structure? What is unique and notable about DOD as an enterprise with a governance structure, just like any other, but probably a little bit unique? Well, you know, first, real quick, uh, I want to thank everyone for having me. Um, when I, I got to, to know Jay and Bobby and Will, and they said, wow, would you, would you come visit? And uh, I realized how ironic life is given they're asking a guy to come talk at school and I barely got out. So um, America is truly a, a great place. But um, <laughs> Not too late to revise that transcript. Well, we'll see. I may not be this afternoon. So um, it, it's, um, there are many commonalities, uh, but frankly, in many ways, um, it, it resembles the private sector in no way, shape, or form. It's, um, it's an artificial environment. It's a one-of-a-kind 
the, the culture, uh, the structure, the governance, down to the resourcing and budgeting, the way that takes place uh, is, is very, very unique. Uh, when I was at Beechcraft, I was asked by our CEO, I led a group that worked and provided a lot of products into the government. He said, my goodness, I just don't understand how all this works. How do I understand? I said, run as fast as you can in that wall head first. And when you're dazed and confused, then you're prepared to start understanding how it works. Um, it, it's uh, the governance, uh, especially in a senior leadership role. I explained to people that uh, we had a variety of different operating entities in each of the three services, which were about 160 to 170 billion dollars a piece, uh, a piece plus the corporate um, entity, and we had a board of directors of 535 people, which is the Congress, and each of them had often had their own perception or agenda on, on how things work. So uh, in many ways, uh, you apply a lot of your soft skills that you, you learned, uh, perhaps at the highest level. Uh, but frankly, you, you've just got to understand how it works, because if you don't, uh, you won't be effective. Jay, I want to uh, follow up on that. Looking at the uh, history of the Pentagon, there's actually a long and distinguished tradition uh, in the Defense Department of senior business executives uh, then taking leadership positions at the Pentagon. You know, Charlie Wilson, one of the first secretaries of defense, Robert McNamara, David Packard, of course, of Hewlett Packard. Uh, I've got to put a plug in our own Bill Clements, uh, former CEO of SEDCO, and then uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Um, so were there uh, any of your predecessors coming from you know, senior uh, business leadership positions uh, over to the Pentagon that, that you look to as role models or as examples or maybe as cautionary tales? No. Well, I think it, this somewhat flows yeah. from the first answer yeah. in that um, the, the process, the culture uh, is so unique uh, to simply come in. And, and we've seen a long history of people say, well, I was successful at Ford or I was successful at Searle, wherever it may be. Mm -hmm. And I'm just simply going to take those, those processes, uh, those approaches, and I'm going to say we are going to do this. And uh, the, the, the governance, the process is so unique. And many of those are not just a practice. Many of those are laid in law. Mm -hmm. And the, what, what you might do in the private sector and what you might can do um, in, the, um, in, the, in the department, in the government, um, frankly, this can have you in jail. Um, so the, what you find is those that have what we'll call it a spirit that comes from the private sector, um, but have an appreciation and experience of the art of the doable and how things get done. Um, I think in this most recent role, we had someone come in and say, you know what, I'm gonna approach this no different than if we had just come into an, a new organization, we'd assimilated into, into the company, and we're gonna take 15% of that out in year one. You know, quite commendable. Uh, the only problem is that the budgets which are driving how you do business today and how you resource and what's available were determined between 24 and 30 months ago because of the way it's made. And the ability to come in and say, well, I'm gonna cut this we're just going to take them. By the way, in that organization, 15% is $100 billion. And to be able to say, I'm just going to do that, well, you can give it a go. Um, I can tell you, you will be a frequent visitor to Capitol Hill uh, because there will be people that say, uh, as in, no, you can't, mm -hmm. and it isn't going to happen. So the, really the core of your question, I think people that, that have the spirit, the experience, and the discipline from the private sector to drive innovation, uh, to drive efficiency and effectiveness, yet understand the environment you're working in so you can actually accomplish something. Yeah. 
I know Bobby's got the next question, but I am reminded of a uh, memorable line from Bob Gates about the transition from uh, one leadership position to another. Of course, he was the, uh, you know, one of our more recent and very successful secretaries of defense. And before that, he was the, Gates was the president of Texas A&M. And uh, when Gates was back at the uh, uh, Pentagon, uh, when he had started there in, um, uh, at the end of 2006, a friend of mine asked him, you know, Secretary Gates, you know, it's a welcome back to government. Uh, how would you compare uh, running the Pentagon to your time as uh, president of Texas A&M, you know, leading a, another large bureaucratic organization? And Gates responded with his own question. He said, well, what's the difference between a terrorist and a tenured professor? And I said, well, it is. He said, you can negotiate with a terrorist. So, anyway, so. <laughs> Dean Hartzell's laughing. All right. I can't, I can't decide whether to be offended or proud of that remark. Yeah, right. uh, so, Jay, uh, many organizations in the business world are large, but again, nothing, nothing like the scale of the Pentagon. What is the effect of that size and scope on the, the process of translating from the things we've been talking about to the actual execution of the mission, to the business of carrying out the nation's defense? The, if you think about it, the, each of the services grew up on their own. And so, uh, and, and each of them have uh, a very strong heritage, a very strong personality, and a very strong culture, and frankly, varied missions. Um, and those missions complement each other in a joint environment. Well, that also drives very strong personalities who are going to do things a certain way. Uh, and that translates then to the operational aspect and the business side of it as well. So part of my most recent responsibilities was let's bring an enterprise-wide approach, leverage the enterprise to bring greater effectiveness and efficiency to both the mission and, and the business side. And all of this yields additional resources back. Well. I'll give, you, I'll give you a good example of something that um, was just uh, uh, a typical. Um, what's happened is each of the services developed a system, a technology and a system, and a process to write contracts. Pretty basic stuff. It doesn't matter whether you're buying bombs or, or toilet paper. And uh, they... And, and often within a service, there might be multiple. So across the enterprise, we had 41 systems that, that wrote contracts. Well, the inefficiency to that was if the Army is writing something and it's a common issue uh, or, or um, product or service, the Air Force might be doing the same thing, but each one of them does it for the first time. And not only do you lose inefficiency in actually putting a contract out there, but you lose the best of. Who's got the best of features in writing contracts? And then you get to a pricing issue. That who's, how do we search and look across and say, who's buying widgets in the best value? And we leverage that. That wasn't available. So we got everyone together. We analyzed it. And um, I went through multiple meetings. I sat at a table with 20 people down each side, a lot of them with pitchforks and knives, and, and then people on the walls. And, like, and, and I said, this could go on forever, but we are going to go to one contract writing solution. And we had, we had done the homework, picked it, figured out the best way how to allow the others to collapse and get out of their existing contracts. And I heard all the, the reasons why we couldn't, and oh, you know, the drama. And I said, but we're going to. And I said, the one thing that we're going to do different is once we go, we're going to be here to help you transition. We're not going to fire and forget and walk away. We're going to be here to help you. And they're like, OK, OK. But I will tell you, I walked out of that meeting and 20 minutes later, I got a call from someone who said, the Air Force is backing out. And yeah. I had to trot down. And the good news, I had to trot down and see the Secretary of the Air Force and said, yeah, your folks are, okay, okay. They got that cow back into the herd. <laughs> you know, the next day, it was the Navy. Or it was, 
so you're, 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 even after a decision is made, it, it's, it's a constant. But the alternative is to fall back to where we were. And I know this is a, is a long-winded one, but I will tell you, when you have a relatively fixed top line, our responsibility was to lower the cost of doing business. And when you do that, you generate additional resources to give back for additional capacity for the men and women in uniform to execute their mission. And the other is, that's just the right thing to do on behalf of all of you that invest in, in our department. Um, so it was, um, there, it, it, it's a, and that was every day, and that was one of 25 things that, that I was dealing with. But, um, you know, if it wasn't us, then who? Mm -hmm. So. Real quick follow up on that. So I assume it worked out over time and did give back and it yield the efficiencies you were seeking. Is it the sort of thing now where if someone came along and tried to change it, everyone who used to be complaining about it would all be saying, How, you can't change this. This is, this is our system. No. Uh, I think if you look at people that have made significant change, operational or process change, really which is a mindset, and it doesn't matter whether it's GM, Ford, or IBM, there have been books written about it, they'll tell you that it's, it's five, seven years to really see it go. Um, I think it's a flywheel effect. You, you have to, people have to see that it yields benefit and then they slowly start buying into it. There's skepticism. Uh, one of the things we fought for inside the building as well as on the Hill was if we're able to generate efficiencies, that whoever generates them keeps them. Now, to all of you, you might say, well, of course. Well, no, no. No, we have a, we have a group between the Hill and, and the corporate office of Office of Secretary of Defense, we have a, uh, pretty much are known as robber barons, and uh, any savings are, are gone. So you can see there's a nat natural inclination. They say, well, why, what's my incentive to save? But we said, you have to allow them to keep their savings to reinvest. And uh, that, was a, that was a very fragile coalition, both in the building and on the hill, that uh, said, do not take our money. And uh, that we did keep, but I'm afraid, Bobby, we, we, it's going to take you know, a couple of years before people really say, I'm, I'm fully committed to that. So I do want to follow up on this uh, question about Congress's role, and I guess to, you know, by way of preface, uh, as politically divided and polarized as our country is right now, just about all Americans can agree that they're fed up with Congress, right? That's, that's one thing that brings America together. I mean, you know, Congress consistently gets somewhere between 10 and 12 percent approval ratings, uh, and you wonder what's wrong with those 10 and 12 percent. Yes. Um, but, you know, all snark aside, drawing on your time at the Pentagon in the Bush administration, then again, of course, more, more recently, um, did you find any pleasant surprises in dealing with Congress? Were there e either at the staff level or at the member level or committee chair level ones who you actually found constructive and helpful to the, uh, the Pentagon mission overall? Um, and then related to that, any particular ways that you found Congress especially frustrating to deal with beyond the, the normal frustrations? So, the good and the bad. So I think the answer is all of that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, the, the the less enjoyable were hearings um, that there were certain medical procedures I'd be much more fond of than that. Uh, and, but I will say this, that during my first go around, um, I, I was very uh, disheartened and discouraged by the behavior of, of Congress towards uh, what I felt like was something that was an American issue, um, national defense, national security. But amazingly, in the fact that many people describe what, where you say we are, and, and I think we'd all agree that very uh, extreme, very divisive, I found the congressional environment to do the mission I was responsible for, to be exceptionally positive and helpful this time. That the professional staff of the committees that were relevant in um, the House and Senate Armed Services 
were very receptive to say, what can we do to help? Uh, and the members themselves were, were very much in tune. I believe a lot of that was because the, the subject I dealt with was very agnostic. I, I think it was, it was let's be more efficient with our resources. But um, very receptive. Um, I, I think there's an element they can't help themselves from time to time. I don't know how many might be familiar with uh, what's called the Jedi cloud. Um, any folks kind of got that? Really, it was the it was the the desire to implement a very common commercial private sector practice. You store your data in the cloud, and it, it allows you uh, greater security. It allows you broader access. Uh, in our case, it was both uh, a business as well as a mission issue because so much now of technology goes all the way to the, the front of the edge of the battlefield and the tip of the spear that you want your men and women in uniform to have the most complete and timely data there is to make their decision about going over that hill. And the cloud allowed you a portion of that as well as to have the, the most complete data. So pretty basic. Um, we happened to reconstitute the business board, defense business board. We got Bill Simon on that board as chairman, who's former CEO of Walmart. Um, we had uh, the former CIO of, the, of GM on there. And you know, I'd say, what do you think? Oh, this is a no-brain. But I will tell you, it got so politicized. Um, I, I was a frequent visitor to the Hill with a, what in the hell are you doing? And, and because they didn't have all the facts. They didn't understand where it coming from. But, um, but I really, I, I, I'm very encouraged about, about a lot of behavior right now um, on certain things. And I think they, maybe in that aspect, they get a bad rap. So you just mentioned some of your interactions with the Hill that are in the nature of you getting hauled up there. <laughs> That's one way to interact with the Hill. Of course, hopefully a lot more of it is uh, more purposeful where you're initiating it or someone else in the department's initiating it because DOD has something it wants to get done. Can you talk about how does the department, how does that organization influence uh, the course of legislation, budgets, et cetera? How do you, how do you exercise uh, your, your, how do you pursue your goals with that institution? So I, uh, it's interesting, the department, I think, uh, has had a history of dealing with Congress from a standpoint of saying, you know what, we're the Department of Defense. We know what we're doing, this is our mission, we got it, just stay out of the way. Um, okay, that, that perhaps relieves some short-term pain, but uh, I'm not so sure that meets the longer-term goals. Um, just from, the, from my time, the first go, observation and, frankly, instinct, I took a completely different tack. And that is, if we're going to make significant change, then we need them on board. They authorize our money. They appropriate our money. They write the laws about what you can and can't do. And if you want to do something significant and disruptive, they have to be involved. So I picked out all those that I knew would be the influencers on the committees uh, from other aspects. And it, it was agnostic to the side of the aisle. That made no, no difference. And I went up and I said, I'm going to come to you as frequent as you'd like, just like a board of directors, and say, let me explain to you the strategy. Let me explain to you what we're doing. Let us explain what's next in the near term that we're going to do. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, let me also tell you where I need your help, where you need to participate. And I did that on a regular basis with good or bad news or simply updates. And there was actually, uh, in the most recent law, there was uh, a piece that was written that said the corporate headquarters was going to have to be reduced by 25%. 
That was out of a conversation I had with Mac Thornberry leaning forward, talking about what we could or couldn't do, and they actually came to me and said, how should this law be written? And that's what you want. You want that relationship, and it only comes from being proactive, being transparent, being honest, and communicating, and uh, I think you come with good results. And it does work. You mentioned Mac Thornberry, and it prompts me to, to interject before, before Will goes next with a quick follow-up. So Mac's a fellow Longhorn, um, and he's announced he's resigning. Can you say anything about what it's meant for well, his role? Retiring. So. Right, yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah, right, yes, yeah, yeah. retiring. Um, can you talk about like his impact on the Armed Services Committee process and what it, what it means for him to be stepping away? Well, I, he was great. Uh, he, he understood the subject matter because he'd been on the committee. Um, he had the personality that says, I'm doing this because it's good on behalf of America. Uh, and he was, I won't say politically agnostic, but apolitical, but, but he did it about the mission. And um, he was willing to entertain all sides. He's just, he's just a good person and a good leader. Uh, and I also know, I've worked with Adam Smith, who's now the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. He's a good man, too. Uh, so he, he also understood one of the earlier comments about the art of the doable. And that is he picked something, not just let's solve everything. What is something that impacts everything as much as we can? And it was acquisition reform. And he chose that and went after it. And he truly made significant strides. So um, I don't think he's irreplaceable, but just like any leader, uh, you, it, it's uh, so much of it's about the individual and their, and their personality. But he, he will be missed. And uh, I personally enjoyed working with him a great deal. I want to ask a question that I hope will uh, touch on both your private sector experience in the aviation industry and then uh, your, your time at the Pentagon, which is the um, uh, last 20, 30 years, there's been a pretty significant consolidation of, uh, in the aviation industry, especially among uh, major defense contractors, you know, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, really. Uh, it's compared to in the you know, 60s, uh, there were you know, 60s and 70s, there's so many more of them. Uh, from both the private sector side and the Pentagon side, do you think overall that consolidation has been a net positive with more efficiencies and um, economies of scale, et cetera? Or has it been more of a negative as far as reduced competition, innovation, so on and so forth? Uh, no. The, if you look at who we are and where we are and where we stand in the national security environment, and by the way, I'm not a policy guy, but um, certainly been close enough to it maybe to have an opinion, that um, I can tell you if my child was in uniform and willing to serve and went in harm's way, I don't want them in a fair fight. I want them in a fight without any question we will dominate. I mean, that's very selfish, but that's what I want. And what that means is when we look out at, at who are potential threats to who we are, uh, then we have to assemble and say, what, what capabilities do we need to have, be in a dominant position? So much these days of capabilities uh, are technology. And based on all the laws of technology, you know, that's rapidly changing and evolving. And, and to be dominant, you have to be innovative and creative and, and very agile. Well, the, I would just say we're not there. And the, the, the real 
amazing thing is, is that spirit and that innovation, that creativity um, comes from who we are. So many people in this room or what you'll go out and do, it's the small and mid-sized businesses that are very agile and nimble and exciting and innovative. And, they, and I've seen it. They come up with just some holy cow stuff. And you say, well, I can see how this would enhance this mission, yet we can't pair them. And I, I pity those, those businesses out there that have just with their true spirit have come up with this and then go, oh, my God, how can I make this work? And then they just become frustrated. And we, um, And I think... The ability to sustain from a working capital standpoint, the ability to sustain, how do you even get in and who do you talk to? How do I get a contract? Um, we've made it so you, you, you have to filter through these very few primes because of consolidation. And then uh, we have an acquisition process that, and we've talked about it, and we're maybe getting a little bit better, but does not embrace that and does not um, really nurture it. Um, we've, we've that's tough, and, it, and, and uh, a lot of the primes, I think, at this point, the big ones, to move the needle financially, a lot of what they have to do is financial engineering. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's M&A work, and, and the, the, the organically developing something just isn't, isn't going to move the needle uh, on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So I think we've gotten ourselves into a bit of a pickle, and um, both from a process standpoint, from the industrial complex, uh, and, and we need to find a way to tap into what makes America great. On the subject of private sector businesses that, that sell to the Pentagon, so you talked about the primes. Uh, is, is there anything you can share about what life is like that's different for companies that, that for whom the Pentagon is the sole or at least an important customer? Um, given that we have a number of future business leaders here, some of them may find that that's actually their sole or most important customer. What do they need to know? So I've likened doing business with defense, and I think the United States government, but defense is, is at $700 billion and on its own, I think, is like the 11th largest economy in the world. Um, I've, I've somewhat likened it to doing business with Walmart. Um, you, you, you get a lot of businesses out there say, oh, I'd love to get in with Walmart, because if I do, my top line is, look at that. Look what I'm exposed to. And, and I've seen it, and I've been there and done that. And then you look up in five years and go, I didn't make any money. Um, I think defense is not a lot different than that. And I, I, my advice that I would give all of you, I give myself, um, as I'm, I'm pondering maybe getting involved in some businesses now, be successful commercially with a product. Then you take that product, and if it has applicability into the mission, you say, all right, I'll offer you this. You do it on your terms. And you have to have the discipline if they come back and say, oh, well, gee whiz, we're going to tell you how to price it, how to structure it. We're going to lay in all these administrative and regulatory requirements. You can just say, no, thank you, and have the discipline to walk away. Uh, I'm hoping, based on your earlier question, if we can truly solve that first problem I talked about, the ability for all of you to provide some great solutions becomes a lot easier. The department says, love it, we're willing to pay your price, it's fair, it's market, you've already demonstrated that, let's go. You have a simple contract, simple pricing, you make money. It's okay, it's not evil to have a profitable entity. And that's where um, I, I think that'd be the advice and, and then keep your fingers crossed. One more question from me, and then we'll uh, uh, take some questions from the audience. So please be uh, preparing any questions you may have. Um, uh, so if, uh, if Secretary Esper were in the room with us now, as opposed to Afghanistan or flying back from Afghanistan as he is today, uh, how would you advise him to prioritize and make the most of the job for the next 16 months that he presumably 
has. <laughs> Uh, well, I know Mark. Um, I worked with Mark, and I'd say thank you, and good luck, and God bless you. Um, but one of the one of the things I learned when I was in my Air Force spot, and and again on this, um, because of the uniqueness of how things work. First of all, you don't start anything that you can't finish. Uh, so he has to be aware that his term could be up uh, in, on January 20th of noon, 2021. And if you can't get something to critical mass by that point, then don't go ahead and start it now. Use that time and that effort to put to something else. And then the other is, um, again, there's the art of the doable. Pick, pick what makes the biggest impact that you really feel like you can do and you focus on those things and, uh, and the other, as much as you may have a passion for it, you just, you have to say, I've, I've got to, I've got to know, know what uh, my limits are. Um, and I would say selfishly keep pushing on driving more efficient and effective business practices at the enterprise level. Uh, it's, we are, we, we are not going to see more money. And we, we as a government are not going to see more money. So you're going to have to make do with what you have. And the best way to do that is be more efficient and generate additional capacity. Um, one last thing I'll mention, and, and this is something that's really important, I think, for people to understand. I said, well, again, why is the private sector and, and government different? Remember this. In the private sector, uh, we all say you can measure your success by one simple thing. It, it's financial. You look and say, okay, how did all this strategy translate? And you go, it's right there. Either we did or we didn't. In the Department of Defense, our, our mission is to, to maintain national security by dealing with those that would threaten us. Well, that, that scorecard is a little bit different. And so when you come in and say, hey, we should, we should start creating efficiencies here and there and generate more money, that is disconnected with the task and mission that you're given. And that's why it's some of the hardest thing to do is try and get people to focus on that because it ultimately the mission is defense of our country. Uh, and that's always going to be in place. And that's, uh, that's fairly significant. All right. Well, with that, let's open up to the audience. There's a microphone at the front of each end of the aisle. And if uh, you're ready to come forward, we will take your questions now. Or else Will and I will just keep asking questions. Okay, we are professors. <laughs> Thank you. And please introduce yourself. Sure. Ashish. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Ashish Dave. I'm a sophomore studying business honors, plan two honors, and finance. Um, I really appreciated the last point you made about connecting maybe sort of a disparate idea of efficiency to the ultimate scorecard of national security. So, I'm currently the head of finance and strategy at the Texas Rocket Engineering Lab. Um, very technical organization, and I think our budget is about 30,000 times smaller than the Department of Defense. Um, but a couple but you questions. you have to deal with Congress. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to deal with engineers. Uh, and, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, and it's a little difficult to speak that language. Um, so I want to ask you, how did you get your arms, you know, from a business background, how did you get your arms around some more technical uh, aspects of the DOD? Um, and then how did you translate the language of business um, to fit that ultimate goal of national security while you know, communicating that efficiency does help that goal? I think I, I had several benefits. Uh, one, and, and part of the reason I ended up in, in D.C. Uh, the first time and then subsequently the second is my father was uniform. 
So he was Army Air Corps, Army Air Force, Air Force. Uh, so I'd grown up around the concept um, and then actually some of the more uh, understanding how the service worked, a lot of the moving parts. Um, be honest with you, it, it was interesting as I was, I didn't get a job immediately. I went up and knocked on doors and just said, hey, I'd love to serve. And uh, that took about two years. And uh, I'd go see Bill at the Army. He said, I don't have anything, but I'm going to introduce you to Fred at the Navy. I'd race down the hall and go see him, and I did that for a while. But what's, to your point, between what's out in the public domain, you can look at GAO reports, you can look at things that are out there. It's am amazing the amount of public information that's out there. And it can talk from the issues at hand. You can look at testimony from uh, from folks in hearings that disclose that. Uh, you can, uh, there's just a lot of, of, because it is the government, there's amazingly a lot more information out there than you get. And so you can start to become much more literate in the subject. Uh, and uh, then uh, there's an element of the fact that I didn't get a job immediately when I heard people at Navy or Air Force or Army tell me what they did. I was, I was, um, picking up the issues that were relevant, the p issues that were a priority. And, and it really, as I said, I was much better at doing my job when I came in because of the fact I didn't get it immediately. Um, and then there's, there's just, I think you, there, you, going into any organizations, you keep your, your ears open, your mouth shut. Uh, and, and you go to as much as you can, and, and then after that, you're kind of on your own. You have to trust your instincts. But, um, and then I was just very fortunate that um, I, I had a, a natural intellectual curiosity for it. Thank you. You bet. Hi there. Uh, I'm Theo Milanopoulos. I'm a, a pre-doctoral fellow at the Clement Center. Um, the national defense strategy was the first in almost a decade, um, and I was curious about what role your office played either in developing or implementing a document that had such a kind of strategic reorientation uh, that it did uh, in, the, in the government. So uh, it, it was interesting. I was very much uh, involved in that. And there were several aspects of that that were, as you described, were unique. One is let's have one. Let's have one that's relevant, uh, that truly you can take strategy and, and point to it and translate it into action. Then it got hard, of course. Um, but uh, the secretary was very passionate about that concept. And so, our particular role, or I'd say my particular role, was really twofold. One was just be there and offer perhaps um, leadership or management insight into uh, certain aspects of that might be secondary effects, resourcing, structure, efficient. In other words, if you were predicating, you want to you want to make some significant, you want to pursue something that might have structural changes what might be the optimal way beneath that in execution to, to do the, uh, the structural. Um, and then as you look to say, okay, now how are we gonna resource this strategy? There became very much of a budgetary aspect where like anything, there's always gaps. It, it never lines up to, wow, what a coincidence. We need a hundred bucks, we got it. And so how do you close those gaps? And uh, there were, of course, you can always make programmatic type of changes. That really wasn't our gig. And I was very pleased when you start talking about we're gonna stop this or stop that, that can get quite emotional and <laughs> contentious. Um, but more, no, we think we can generate these types of resources out of IT, out of services, uh, whatever it might be. And so uh, that was really, uh, we, we were, we, I think we just played our management role in summary. 
Hey, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Powell. You talked a little bit about um, the difficulty that small businesses have in integrating into the defense industrial complex. I guess the question that I have is, is from like 2005 to 2008, the, our, the Rapid Fielding Initiative program was able to get you know, good ideas from the private industry and relatively small companies to warfighters you know, very quickly, whether that be MRAPs, whether with various anti-jamming um, or common missile warning system, stuff like that. Why is that not the, you know, that best practice model that's still being practiced today? Have you thought about running for office? <laughs> <laughs> and, and because your point is very valid. You have to ask yourself, why does an organization in wartime stand up an alternative method to acquire? You're, you're, you're admitting our fundamental process doesn't work. And, and it's a head scratcher. Uh, be, and especially after you do it to accommodate, let, how do we have rapid deployment of these technologies to meet the rapid evolution on the battlefield? We have to stand up a separate process. Okay. But then, after all that's said and done, why don't we incorporate the lessons learned into the normal process and say we've evolved? Honestly, I, I, I made that comment because I think it's going to be a congressional issue to step in and say, change the laws, let's drive a change in how we do this. Um, I, I'm sorry my answer is somewhat empty, but I... I I, I, your frustration is real, and it's uh, it, it, it's uh, very appropriate. Uh, so I, I guess it's kind of a follow-up to that. You know, so the Air Force has the Defense Innovation Unit. The Army is standing up Army Futures Command. Do you think that there is the necessary backing in Congress and or whatever establishment it needs that backing in? to be effective going forward in modifying those acquisition processes? It's mixed. So uh, when, for example, DIU stood up, which is Defense Innovation Unit, I'm not sure if everybody knows that. But it, so it was to begin to address some of these, these issues, both from an acquisition standpoint and the earlier comment I made about tapping into the private sector into technologies and processes, more technologies to, to marry up. Um, but I can tell you, because I've been there and done that, the opinion of DIU is mixed on, in Congress. And when that happens, you get attention. Anything they develop, you have their supporters, say, yeehaw, let's go, and you have their detractors, says, whoa which then puts you in a, in a position to not really take advantage of whatever the underlying issue is. Um, Futures Command, I, I applaud it 100%. I think it's great. I think the real key will be in execution. It, 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 you know, standing it up, and, and I believe the people involved behind it, the leadership all have um, nothing but an innovative mentality. But remember, that then has to have a process to tap into the private sector to partner and multiply with, uh, be a catalyst, an accelerator, whatever you want to call it, so you actually achieve mutual benefit. And that, that will be in the execution. Um, and I hate to say, I, I was asked a question on Friday at Executive MBA is, is wow, you know, why haven't we seen any contracts let? We have a real hard time. We just take time to figure out what color to paint the walls. And I mean, that's a standard process. So, um, but it's getting there. I mean, great ideas, but it, it's execution. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, we got time for one more. Lieutenant Colonel Kendall. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Ryan Kendall, a first year PhD student at LBJ. 
Sir, my question is, uh, given all of the, the limitations of both the business culture and the statutory requirements that you outlined earlier with DOD, uh, and each service having its own unique culture, how do you see each service adapting to different technologies that are presenting themselves either in uh, the enemies and the threats that we face, such as artificial intelligence or the, uh, the build out of information technologies? What do you see each service doing well? And then what do you see each service as uh, needing to change? So I do want to, in summary, uh, say that a lot of my comments on the particulars may not have been exactly encouraging or overly positive. But I will say that I believe the, the, what you're seeing in each of the services uh, right now is as innovative and creative and willing to search out and find and try new processes as I've ever seen. Incredible. Uh, and, and each of them has their own personality and is, is going after what their particular uh, demands are. So I think it's fantastic um, and very positive. But at the end of the day, the overarching uh, procedures and policies and laws serve as a governor on that. And, and so I just think we, we could do so much more. The other is there is a natural inclination to avoid leveraging the enterprise. So in other words, to your point, you talked about AI. When we start talking about putting AI together, consolidated at the enterprise level, um, and you, you set with the, the service leaders, and like, who's doing AI? They're all doing AI. And okay, how do we all sit in a room and let's pick how we leverage each other, let's not duplicate, and oh my goodness, the groaning and, and hesitation because there's a natural inclination that, that OSD or the corporate headquarters is going to kill it, is going to over bureaucratize, I guess is the word. and. Um, you know, there's an element that's true. So I'm incredibly um, positive about what's going on, the innovative spirit. Um, I just want to see it unleashed, truly unleashed. Um, and I think that's where we're going to have to get into a lot of the processes and so forth. But what's going on on, on, on um, weapons and, and capabilities, hypersonics, directed energy, so forth, AI, and all that um, really is, is, is great. We just, let's do it in the most efficient, effective manner. Is that, did that? Yes, sir, it did. Get Thank you, you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. All right, well, please join me, uh, join us in thanking uh, Jay Gibson so much for his uh, happy return to the 40 acres and those great insights. All right, thank you all. Thank you.